Hello and welcome to the CFO Playbook podcast. I'm David McClelland. I'm a journalist and broadcaster. I cover technology and business with a special interest in startups. And here on the CFO Playbook podcast, we get under the skin of how world-class finance leaders from across various industries set goals, manage teams, leverage technology, plan for the future, and much, much more. And in today's episode, we chat artificial intelligence in financial services with fintech veteran Giles Andrews, OBE, co-founder of London-based unicorn neobank Zopa. I think I was much more of a founder than I was a CFO. I mean, I'm not an accountant, <laughs> so, uh, but I drew the straw of CFO um, because I think I could run a payroll. Um, and I knew how to run a purchase ledger. If you're listening to the show for the first time, then, well, welcome. Don't forget to subscribe. Take a look through our extensive back catalogue. And as many of you have, leave us a rating or a view. Right then, let's get on with the show. This episode of the CFO Playbook is brought to you by Soldo. Thousands of businesses from small to large corporations, including Mercedes-Benz, Sony and Get Your Guide, use Soldo to make their business spending simple and efficient. To find out more or to book a demo, visit soldo.com. Giles Andrews co-founded Zopa in 2004 as the world's first peer-to-peer lending business. And in 2016, he received an OBE in the New Year's honours lists for services to the financial services industry. In the same year, he was recognized as FinTech Leader of the Year in the FinTech Innovation Awards. Zopa is now a fully-fledged, profitable digital bank and provides financial products to more than 1 million customers and has made more than £8 billion worth of loans. From CFO to CEO to chairman and now an active board member, Charles now shares his expertise among many other organizations too. Giles, thank you for joining us today. That's a pleasure. Good to meet you, David. Uh, we'll come to your time at Zopa and perhaps pre-Zopa too in in, uh, in a moment. But I want to ask you to summarise where you're at right now because you have, as it were, your your card in a lot of ATMs, your keys in a number of ignitions, so to speak. Well, I, I'm, I'm delighted to still be involved in Zopa. So um, I, as you as you referred, I sat, sit on the board. I represent sort of... Uh, the interests of, of, of lots of minority shareholders. But, I mean, ironically, given we started Zopa to be, if not an anti-bank, certainly a, sort of a competitor of the banks, I sit on the board of three banks now, um, one of which is Zopa. Uh, I also sit on the board of Bank of Ireland in Dublin, where I, I chair their uh, Transformation Oversight Committee. So that's quite fun, looking at how uh, a traditional legacy business can, can try and stay relevant and reinvent itself for the modern age and the modern consumer. And I also sit on the bank of a very board of a very different bank, um, a 350-year-old private bank in London that doesn't seek to um, market itself too, 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 too broadly, but, but has a very, very interesting business, offers extraordinarily high levels of customer service. And I think there are lessons from all of those three institutions to all three of those institutions, which is, which is fun. I also hark back to my first career, which was in the motor industry, um, and I, I chair a company called Carwow, which is a, a marketplace that helps people buy or sell new or used cars um, and has a, a, an extraordinary content channel. So it's now the largest YouTube channel in the world. What do you look for then in your in your portfolio of of interests? Clearly, you like to be busy. Clearly, you've had a, a lot of experience. First of all, in the, in the motor industry, and, and we'll touch on that in a moment. And then, of course, in Zopa, at the stage of your your life, your your career right now, what is it that you're looking to to bring? What is it you're looking to add with the, the benefit of your experiences? Well, I think. We- we sort of have to be cognizant of what we're what we've done in our lives. If we if we seek to 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 help our boards develop and companies develop through through board membership, um, and you know, my, twenty years of my um, work experience and the most recent has been in in financial services, um, and initially in fintech, but moving more in, more into banks as they got transitioned into being. Um, so I think I've got some relevance to. Um, the banks outside of Zopa in terms of trying to help them on their digital journey. And as I said, very different institutions, very different issues, but both 
have to remain relevant to changing consumer behavior. Um, and I really enjoyed my exposure to the car industry because it was uh, my first love. So hopefully I can, I can see a sort of big picture of how that industry is changing fundamentally with, with the move to electrification, obviously. Um, yes. that, that has a phenomenal change to the whole supply chain. The way cars are bought and sold, I think, will change over time. I love how you stayed very much plumbed into your passions there. And even though your professional career took you uh, took you left at the traffic lights, perhaps the, the junctions maybe are, are, are rejoining. Uh, 20 or so years later and uh, and let's let's touch on the last 20 or so years since you co-founded Zopa and in your time there you've been on a number of transitions from CFO when you co-founded in 2004 to CEO in 2007 and then to chairman in 2015 and then stepping diagonally I guess onto the board in 2019 like you say where you sit right now. Um, Talk to me first though about being a founder and a CFO. Did they always go hand in hand for you? Was there a potential for conflict? You know, the founder part of your brain may be nudging you in one direction, but the CFO part counselling you in another? Or was that a fairly easy balance for you? I think I was much more of a founder than I was a CFO. I mean, I'm not an accountant, <laughs> so, uh, but I do the straw of CFO um, because I think I could run a payroll. Um, and I knew how to run a purchase ledger. So my background as an entrepreneur had, had, uh, and, and had, yeah, as an entrepreneur, often you have to manage lots of fun, matters financial. So I, I knew, I think, I think I was the only one in the team who knew how to do that. Um, and my original role in the company was to help them raise some money. Um, so I led the fundraising efforts, and I think it was a sort of natural development from from being the fundraiser. Uh, other people were responsible for developing the product or the technology there were like four or five of you of you i think at the beginning of Zopa, weren't they yeah. yeah there were we were quite a big planning team actually um and therefore i think it was helpful for for one of us to put our hands up and say okay we'll, we'll worry about the first strings times have changed um what about when you moved then to ceo short shortly after you went live in 2005 it was 2007 or so did you backfill them with a, a proper CFO, and again, I, I use that with with big rabbits ears. Um, and what was there a step up to CEO for you? Was that a natural move given the the early trajectory that Zopa was on at that time? Well, I, I'm fortunate. It was a very sad story in that. Um, so, so the original CEO of the business was a, a, a real visionary, a guy by the name of Richard Duval. Um, who, who, Zopa actually wasn't his idea, but but certainly he was the one who picked it up and ran with it. With the idea came from another guy on the team with a string sheet buyer and a guy called Dave Nicholson. Um, and Richard um, was running the business, was a was a fantastic leader of the business, and and suddenly got very sick um, and died very quickly. Um, he had a, a, a very aggressive type of pancreatic cancer. Um, and, you know, that was a real shock to everybody. Um and I didn't take over immediately. There was a, there was a period of time, but 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 that was the the the, the catalyst, if you like, um, um, to ultimately become a CEO of the, of the company. And by then, I, I wasn't sort of managing the finance. I mean, I mean by then, I had a financial staff. You know, we had customers, and and um, I I don't think I acted actually as a sort of accountant in the business. By the time we had customers and revenue, so take us. Take us back to the mid two thousands or so. Um, as you say, times are very different then. How did Zopa come about, and why was it why was it so disruptive and so different at the time to what else was was happening twenty years ago? So Zopa was a, a disruptive idea. It wasn't necessarily terribly disruptive when it launched um, and, and I'll explain a bit more about that so so we did invent something, we invented something we call peer-to-peer -peer lending which has been copied all over the world um, it's actually pretty well disappeared all over the world as well and we can, we can, we can come back to that but the idea behind it was um, how do we provide a, you know, a better fairer deal in financial services um, which rewards the, the two main Protagonists in financial services, people who have money versus people who, who, who want to borrow money. Um, how can we create a better deal for those? At the time, 
we felt quite strongly that banks weren't looking after their customers very well. And you could see that in things like the PPI scandal, which were just beginning to bubble. It hadn't been unearthed by then, but, but certainly anyone who worked in the industry was pretty well aware of how customers weren't necessarily treated terribly well. Um, and and the, the idea was sort of radical in its simplicity. Um, and it was saying, if you, how do you how do you pare back all the functions of a bank to the most limited uh, in terms of providing a return to yeah. people who provide it with money and, and, and people who get giving a good deal to people who want to borrow money. So how do you do that in the most efficient way possible? Um, ideally, without becoming a bank and with, without being regulated as a bank, and in fact, if you continue that on, without being captured by regulation at all. Um, so one of the innovations of Zopa was finding a way to do this uh, in a fair and reasonable way, but but in an, in, in, in an unlicensed manner, such that the burden of entry, you know, the barriers to entry and, and getting started was just a technology build to make sure you looked after people's money well and had a, a good user interface, but but that didn't worry about conforming to all sorts of, of, of difficult and complicated regulations. From an onboarding point of view, though, was that lack of being uh, having a license, being a, a under a regulation umbrella, was that a challenge in terms of getting people to engage with you in terms of building that that trust with your potential customers? So the biggest challenge of any startup in financial services is building a trust. And I think if you're inventing a new business model, then that's even more pertinent. Um, and yes, yeah, short answer is it, it was a challenge. Less of a challenge to people who wanted to borrow money, although ultimately people who want to borrow money do and should care about where it comes from um, and how that, you know, that's a barometer for how well that organization is going to deal with them in case of difficulty. So, so yes, they do care, but they don't care as much as the people who are giving you money. Um, and I think, you know, naively, we underestimated the challenge of that. We, we thought that you know, if we had a great product, um, it would be easy to to get people to participate, and and it was hard. So, if we launched in March two thousand and five, between then and and the financial crisis, we grew steadily, but we didn't grow we didn't grow fast enough that the trajectory looked like we were going to build an interesting business. Um, it looked like it would be a real challenge. Um, we were growing probably you know, somewhere between fifty and one hundred percent a year, uh, but from nothing, that's that's not. Uh, as dramatic as, as as it might seem, um, and we had raised quite a lot of money, so therefore we were safe for a while, but absolutely not forever. Um, and at some point, um, we were going to run a money. And the question is, would we have had? Did we have an interesting enough business that was growing fast enough to to attract further funding? And I think the jury on that was very much out. Um, we will never know because along came the financial crisis. Yes. Um, Ironically, the financial crisis was an enormous enabler of our business. And, and if you think about it, the Zopa has to exist in, in the spread. So it can only offer savers or depositors or investors, whatever you want to call them. We had to call them investors because they weren't bank savers or depositors yes. um, from a regulated point of view. But, but we had to give them a better deal and we had to give borrowers both a better deal and better service. And in a very narrow bank spread, that's hard. In pre-financial crisis, um, you could get 5% from ING Direct or maybe even Egg or something like that on, on your savings. Um, a product not clearly has to offer a material amount more than that to compensate for the risk. And borrowers were being subsidized by the sale of PPI. Um, and, and banks' very aggressive behavior at the time, you think RBS operating on what, 2 3% left, 2, 2, 2 3 capital, massively aggressive. Um, growth of their balance sheets, um, the assets on their balance sheet, and 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 I think very very thin margins to support that growth, subsidised by the selling of a PPI product that that was not in consumers' interest. Um, 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 you know, that's not something we could do. Um, so so th that was hard. But you think what happened at the crisis, and actually the bad what people often don't remember is the PPI was banned or the, the PPI scandal blew up at almost exactly the same time as, as the crisis. So so bank deposit rates went to zero from five. Um, bank of England, you know, measures to combat the, the, the crisis. Um, bank borrowing rate, the rates that consumer could borrow from a bank went up 
rather than down. They went up because banks were very short on liquidity. Not that they didn't want to lend, but they, they were short of liquidity. So therefore, they were being more discerning in their lending. Um, and and they couldn't subsidize the product with a PPI product. So 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 you went from a spread of you know low single digit, 2-3% to a, for a, for a difference between a deposit rate and a prime loan rate to over 10 so suddenly our job became massively easier, um, and and that, and the trust issue. So in parallel to that, when we talked about trust earlier. Bank trusts went out the window. So although we weren't trusted, um, we were there was not such a sort of negative uh, associated with us. And actually, by then we developed a pretty good track record of lending money very wisely and therefore protecting our investors' money, um, and. And it delivered better credit returns than banks had. You could go to the Bank of England and look at bad debt rates on of all the big banks, and our credit losses were lower than any UK bank. And I think we did very well in that respect. We invested heavily in data. We'll come on to artificial intelligence. We were a very early proponent of machine learning as a subset of artificial mm-hmm. intelligence and, and built extremely good credit models. Um, so we could tell a story which was quite welcome in the media around these big banks are blowing up, doing irresponsible things with your money uh, in consumer language. And you know, this tiny little upstart, um, which doesn't have any of the heritage and isn't regulated, has actually been behaving really sensibly, you know, give them a chance sort of thing. Um, and suddenly we started getting money in from, from investors at a rate that more than kept up with our borrowing demand. That was the first time in the history of the company we'd always had more demand for funds than we had funds available to lend. And suddenly that flipped. Um, and of course, that, that's a luxury. It makes it much easier to, it's like, you know, having a shop with inventory, it's much easier to, to market your product if you know you've got it. And so we could go out and more aggressively market to borrowers knowing we had the funds in place. And in the business, I think 2008, I think we tripled in size. Uh, so suddenly the trajectory changed and you could see it. Or what one of those wonderful paths where the cost base gets overtaken. You could see it if you projected forward. You could see this thing will all make money, um, and, and and therefore we were able to raise money and uh, and, and and save the company. I simply don't know whether that would have happened. That must have been quite a ride at the time. You know, running out of that runway potentially. You know, you can see, you can see the end of the line there. And then this financial crisis coming around. And while you can talk in hindsight about what happened and trust and uh, eventually being able to beat the established uh, banks at their own game, you wouldn't have known that while you're in the thick of it. So I can imagine there must have been quite a few nervous moments, particularly around the beginning of the financial crisis, really not knowing what was going to happen next. Yeah, I think the joys of naivety. Entrepreneurs have to sort of uh, they certainly can't be immune to that kind of stress, but it can't be something that 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 is is too much of a burden because all startups, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, the exceptions are are tiny. These sort of overnight successes, there are always difficult moments that that need to be managed, and uh, I think ultimately that's that's sort of what leadership is all about. Speaking of difficult times, and maybe looking forward to more recent times, the UK and other economies have struggled in the wake of uh, various global challenges. Uh, in your more consultative role now with various organisations, are there lessons that you've been able to take from navigating that 2008 storm to apply to the tempest that has been the 2020s so far, would you say? I, I, I mean, I think transparency of communication is a lesson I learned quite quickly so, you know, your first opportunity to explain a story, explain why something's gone wrong is your own best and possibly only opportunity. And I, I think you, you you continue to see large organizations struggle with that. Um, you know, you, you think of the, some of the, 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 the collapses, the recent collapses in the, in the States in, in the banking sector. Thankfully, not enormous institutions, but actually, I think, probably preventable um, in, a, in terms of, of, of the way the crises were, were, were managed. I mean, I think they both revealed flaws in in business models, in sort of over-concentration. But, uh, I think it was something about Silicon Valley Bank. Um, but but I think ultimately, you know, they, they got the crisis communication wrong and that 
leads to a vicious circle. And of course, you can never use the past to predict what the next crisis will be. Um, but in the same way, they, they couldn't. Um, but you can use the past to inform what would we have done. Banks are simply better capitalized than they used to be. Um, so banks are safer organizations than they have been in the past. The, those recent failures notwithstanding, I mean, they're having that's real flaws in their business model, which actually arguably a regulator should have spotted um, and were very, very apparent with hindsight. Well, I think the organizations are involved in don't have similar flaws. It's not to say they haven't got a flaw that we haven't seen yet, but but they they certainly don't have similar flaws of, of, of relating to that sort of over-concentration or, or that risk-taking in the case of, you know, trying to get a higher return by buying bonds um, rather than doing something more safe and, 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 and robust with your um, excess liquidity. Um, uh, you know, I, I can, I mean, I, I did hear that there was a, there was a, 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 a presentation doing rounds from a well-known strategy consult, uh, consultancy firm extolling the virtues of this strategy to, to generate higher returns um, through 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 the buying of bonds when 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 the central banks were paying very small um, money on on re- returns on reserves as, as you know something that other banks should adopt. Well, thankfully you know, that particular presentation didn't get didn't didn't win too many clients. But um, so I, I think I think a sort of a lesson is to think very seriously about the risks that lie sort of adjacent to to the. We, you know, as a bank, we worry tremendously about the people we lend money to, as we should. So, you know, the, the front and central risk is ultimately credit. Um, but I think there are all sorts of associated, and, and, the, and the, the risk around you know, mismatch maturities is one that banks should also understand, um, given that they do predominantly borrow short and, and lend long. So th- these are well understood risks, but I think that you know, they need to take a sort of broader view as to, as to what else. Uh, potentially lies around the corner. I watched a presentation that you gave, must be about 10 years or so ago now, when you lamented that uh, the innovation that was being lauded as the most important in financial services was still the ATM. Now, a lot can happen in 10 years. So if I were to ask you, what's the most important innovation in financial services over the last 10 years, what would your response be? Well, I think the period I was referring, I'll, I'll answer your question. I'm not trying to avoid it, but I think I think the period I was referring to was a period where where banks were really optimizing for sort of financial engineering, um, and and thoughts of the consumer were really not there. And you know, and it was Volcker who said that um, based on the fact that he was seeing banks grow tremendously and increase their leverage and making more money. Um, but they weren't doing anything that's particularly in the interest of customers. And in, in the UK, you know, there was a £40 billion pound PPI gap that was over-inflating uh, profits for banks were generating. So they didn't need to think too much about customers. And the only potential source of losing customers to, was to another of the big banks who were doing similar things. And there just was no catalyst for innovation. Um, I, yeah. So we launched Oprah in response to some of that, but we launched Opa before the iPhone. Yes. Yes. By about three or so years, I guess. It's in it, close to the iPod. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um so it was an on it was a, a desktop internet business. Um and I think that the movement towards a mobile phone is more fundamental than the movement to a, to a desktop ever was. So, so people found it relatively easy to convert remote customer service models. You know, most banks were operating call centers. Um, call center operators have information to, 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 to respond to custom queries. You can sort of put that online. I mean, I'm massively simplifying here, but, but, but the kind of queries that, that generate requests for data, that, 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 that lead to a request for data to a serving of a piece of data is is a is a process you can imagine um, is is vaguely analogous to to how our call center operative will try and deal with the customer, but the mobile is completely different and allows for people to do it in a, you know you'd rather than go to your PC to do some banking is not that different to going to a branch, but 
doing something immediately when you want uh, in a dramatically simpler way leads to a sort of desire for a level of customer interaction, which is simply different. And, and, and yet some banks have actually tried to convert their internet or their call center offering into the internet, and they then try to convert that into a mobile app. Simply doesn't work. Um, so I would say the innovation is in being is dealing with people in a different context. Um, I when they're out and about, but very situational, but you, the, the, you know, very relevant to what they're doing at that moment. Um, and their demands have gone up exponentially, as as they should, uh, because they can do most things by using this amazingly powerful device. Um, and I think that to answer your question is what has been the catalyst to innovations which probably in and of themselves individually are very small but but lead to a completely different banking experience um and i and i think that the you know the app native digital banks have a real opportunity to build customer franchises um in competition with the big banks in a way that is far in excess of what was open was able to do back in 2005. I think that's really exciting. It's interesting. I guess one of the challenges for any customer facing organization is to meet the customers where they're at. Do you go to your customers? Do you make your customers come to you? Do you meet them halfway? And in the period of time that you're that, that we're speaking about here over the last 10, maybe let's be generous, 15 or so years, where customers are at has changed increasingly. You know, not only has financial services changed and most customer facing organizations changed, the consumers themselves have changed by this adoption to mobile devices. And, you know, when the iPhone launched, going back to your point a moment ago, back in 2008 or thereabouts, I there were lots of incumbents who were mocking, saying, ah, it's this iPhone, it's never going to catch on. No, we all have Black, Blackberries, but we, we, all we could do with Blackberry was email. Yes, quite. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that where customers are at and how customers uh, engage with organizations has itself been rapidly changing. That has meant that um, incumbents in lots of industries um, and challenges have been taking on that challenge have also been keeping up with where customers changing behaviors, changing habits uh, are, are, are moving to, which I find really interesting. It, it also means that the technology has to move a lot further and things that were a lot slower to move, a lot slower to develop, have to become far more agile. Um, speaking of changes in, in technology, let's talk about artificial intelligence, shall we? Now, AI is this uh, decades-old term that means, well, a number of different things. It's often vague. It's often signified uh, the cutting edge of computing capabilities and there have been lots of AI springs and AI winters over the years, some false AI dawns too. But one branch in particular has shown real momentum and promise recently, hasn't it? This uh, generative AI thing. And right now, I'd say AI is the first bullet on the opening slide of most organizations' innovation agenda PowerPoint decks. My kids are using AI to generate images for their homework, and I can't even pick up some bread and milk from my corner shop without chatting about ChatGPT. So... Giles, as a, a fintech veteran, what's been your experience of working with AI in its various guises in financial services? Well, I, I mean, I think you're right to distinguish between different types of AI, and, and some have been around for rather longer than others. Um, and and as I said, we were early adopters of, of machine learning, um, and and using machine learning to improve and iterate credit models in a way that. I think was more agile than anybody else. Um, and that's now quite well understood technology. I think we're, we're still probably trying to keep our heads ahead um, that we use it in, in, you know, increasingly sophisticated ways. Um, and we employ some extraordinarily bright data scientists who, who frankly are keen to work in a fast moving world where they can make a real difference, where they can build models and put them live quickly you know, the sort of development into production cycle um, in, in, a, in a fintech startup, not, not unique to Zoka, but in a, in a fintech startup is, is, is a different proposition to 
to a traditional bank. I think the the world of generative AI is a, is a different sort of technology and is much more unproven. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the amazing growth in market capitalization of some American uh, technology businesses, it's driven almost entirely by by this AI hype boom um, and the fact that people are spending real money. Uh, you know, buying Nvidia chips is reflected in in, in, in that in that in that success. Um, but I think the technology beyond helping your kids with their homework and 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 mine too, um, uh, and 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 unfortunately the sort of the nefarious side of of, of you know deep fake development etc. Um, I suppose the more positive spin of what it's doing in the movie industry in terms of. Uh, special effects and things like that. Beyond those applications, which are all terribly exciting or, or worrying in the case of uh, deep fakery, um, I'm not seeing yet any any trans- What was the old cliche? The technology moves much slower than you expect and then, then suddenly goes much further than you expected from extrapolating the slow tra- trajectory. Um, so, I, I mean, I think lots of companies are exploring how to use some of this generative AI in in sort of customer service side. Um, That's where there are some fairly strong case studies, I think, particularly with, with generative AI and, and customer services. It has to be handled incredibly carefully, though. Oh, it, it does. There are some horror stories, too. And, you know, you have to question whether, in terms of a risk-reward basis, some of the horror stories may transcend the value that, it had created up until the creation of the horror story. But that's not to say that um, investigating that sector isn't really important. And you know, we'd be mad if we weren't doing it as well. Um, and I think it offers you know, anything that can potentially offer a more efficient service that is better for customers. I think I, I, I think it's very dangerous if it's just coming at it from a little cost-cutting point of view. Um, but if you can provide better information to customers and it happens to be cheaper as well, then, then, then that... that that's a that's a fantastic opportunity, I think. Um, so so I, I I'm sure you will see continued progress in that area. I don't know how far it's going to get, um, and I don't know how far you know Elon Musk's visions of everyone being uh, uh, engineered out of a job um, is true. As it's a bit beyond my pay grade, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but, but but I I I I have yet to see. If I was being slightly cynical, I've yet to see uh, benefits to quite meet up with the hype. Um, mm-hmm. But I would definitely counsel anyone to invest and play in this space um, and try and get their people to play in this space because I think the innovations when they appear will be unexpected. Just pick up on a few points there. We speak about the this umbrella term that is AI. Uh, and yeah, you're, you're right. There's a lot of different disciplines that fall within that. The Alan Turing Institute, which you'll know, the UK AI research body, it sees three broad capabilities. The machine learning capability that, that you spoke of, that automating things, which maybe falls into the customer service agents uh, model. And then non-traditional data which is um taking data from um uh, adjacent unstructured data adjacent data so uh, in the insurance industry that might be telematics for car insurance or using images of damaged cars to assess the value of uh, of insurance claims so there's lots of ways to slice and dice that ai thing certainly the we are on on a wave with the generative ai thing at the moment and yeah i the the customer services stuff is is interesting i've not seen all that much in the way of costs associated with it i've seen you know um uh, queries have gone down from resolution of 11 minutes with humans to two minutes with uh, bots yet customer sats have stayed the same but i haven't seen the amount of money that's been plumbed into that um i think that's all very mature i mean both in terms of i'm sure the investment probably outweighs the savings today but also the uh, cost to comp- compute and energy and, and you know this is not this is not trivial um and at some point some of these big ai development companies are going to monitor are going to you know work out how to efficiently monetize their services so I, you know part of which justifies the hype in terms of there's a lot of money being spent in this area um the question is whether it's providing a return yet i, I suspect not um, will it? I'm sure it will. 
but I'm sure it will also be unexpected. Uh, I think it'll be, you know, we'll look back in five years and, and say we didn't see that coming um, in terms of what, what the benefit was. But if you're not experimenting and you're not getting people well-versed in the opportunities of the technology, you're not going to find the adjacent innovations that, that will ultimately make things worthwhile. A lot's said about bias and the black box effect, you know, not really understanding how systems process the inputs in order to come up with whatever the output is. And yet you were speaking earlier on about trust and transparency, particularly in financial services, but really in in, in all organizations, you know, trust seems to be one of those words that's right up there as part of the, the, of the mission statement. So how do we ensure, do you think, that the, the wins in terms of speed and efficiency that AI bring don't also become losses in terms of that trust and transparency that are really important in customer facing organizations yeah, and, and you mentioned adjacent data earlier um you know there are some very important considerations and around the ethics and privacy of of adjacent data and i you know i think this is all work in progress um and um unfortunately i i i personally don't come from a, a school of thought that says you can just let entrepreneurs get on with it and work out what happens um, and, and worry about it afterwards. I, you know, I think there is a role um, for a regulatory framework, which is not necessarily designed by regulators. It was you know, designed by society, um, governments, regulators. And I, I, that worries me. It, 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 it worries me. They're sort of damned if they do and damned if they don't. It worries me that um, they may not do a good enough job and actually consumers do lose trust in services they consume because they feel they're untransparent or or, or they lead to unintended consequences or or you know they they ended up they end up um data that about them being used in ways they hadn't intended what it, in whatever way that might be so that worries me it worries me that there there will be consumer detriment if this thing isn't properly governed but it also worries me um that um Governance is, is 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 too extreme, so I don't envy the people trying to tread that line and and get the balance right. Um, because I, as I say, I think they're slightly damned if they do and damned if they don't. But that, but that's not to say it isn't really important. So so uh, and unfortunately, I don't see a lot of intelligent debate about this. I see you know uh, the entrepreneurs in one camp saying we should be given unfettered ability to do whatever we want because it'll be for the good of humanity, and you know, I, I simply don't believe that's true. Um, but I understand why they're saying it. Um, but I also sort of worry about some less intelligent things that come out of, let's just call it the governance world, whether it be regulators, whether it be governance. Um, but the, the world that is ultimately going to govern this thing, um, ideally internationally, yeah, um, we, as a world, we're not really showing great evidence of being able to work very well together. Um, in all sorts of different ways, so that that worries me. So it sounds a bit negative, but I'm not really sure how to uh, how how they're going to thread that eye of the needle. I will fly a flag at this point in terms of governance for the EU's AI Act, uh, and with the recognition that it it's a, a difficult, maybe impossible challenge. I don't know. I I think that as a first stab at this, the they're, they're further forward in trying to do something about it um, and trying to think intelligently. You know, bless us, we're, we're, we're sort of, uh, sadly, we're not, bless, we don't get too political. We're not part of that world anymore, which is, uh, and therefore not benefiting from that thinking and will probably reject it in, on principle um, without, without, without necessarily considering it. And and I think the, the American view is is somewhat different. So, yeah, encouraging. Well, you're right, encouraging that 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 the EU uh, framework is trying to look at this sensibly and in the round. Bringing it back to things that maybe we can control, though, uh, for our audience of CFOs and finance leaders, what do you recommend they should be scanning the horizon for when it comes to AI-related technologies and uh, and conversations? You know, as I said. AI is right at the top of that innovation agenda, disruptive technology slide that everyone will be looking at multiple times a year. 
So what should they be looking out for in terms of the opportunities, but also being cognizant of the risks as well? Well, I, I think they need to keep themselves informed. I mean, this is going to be a fundamentally different and new technology that will, and perhaps not necessarily in, in, in the working lifetime of the average CFO have an impact, but over over time it certainly will. Um, so I think they need to try and keep themselves as current and informed as they can in whatever means they choose to do that. But I think it also means um, trying to create a, uh, an environment where the their people are current and testing stuff and trying stuff out. I mean, the finance function could be made more more efficient, um, and, and that's generally quite high on the list of most CFOs' priorities. Um, so, so I think CFOs will often come at it from quite a sort of cost saving point of view, and I think that's valid. They should they should they should address that as best they can. But 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 I think that you know, you've got lots of data savvy, smart, dare I say it, young people in the finance function. Um, and I, I, I think they should be encouraged to, 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 to use these technologies. Um, and, and that out of that may, may not, that may come interesting opportunities. Finally, something we ask every guest on the CFO playbook is what liberating finance means to them and but by doing so how it might enable us all or enable them to accomplish more so giles liberate finance what does that mean to you uh, i think it but uh, it's most basic i think it's about people having the opportunity to spend their money and I, i'm now going to talk about companies a bit but spend the money in the way that they would intend to do so something that frustrates me and we took touch on this earlier when we were talking about um the mass bank spot itself pre-crisis because they were sort of overly concerned about financial engineering. I unfortunately see that across broader business today. Um, the sort of creeping of financial engineering and balance sheet optimization, which I think is the issue of Mizzou for not paying people. Um, and and I find it tremendously frustrating, um, often wearing my small company hat, that uh, small companies are, for want of a better word, abused by big companies in terms of not paying them. Um, and I, I just see that becoming more and more prevalent and more normalized because it's deemed to be part of a good thing called optimization, whereas in reality, I think it, 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 it's not, it's denying the lifeblood, which is called revenue, that small companies need to survive. And um, I would like to see that address. I think that's something that we can all get behind. Um, Charles Andrews, OBE, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thanks very much, David. It's good to chat. <laughs>